Um, okay, so just to inform you that uh, the proceedings will be recorded and um, the video will be made available later on via the LIASA uh, website uh, uh, YouTube channel. So I'd like to welcome everyone this morning. Uh, I think this is the fourth uh, uh, conversation with leaders that we are, are presenting today. And a very warm welcome to Ellen Tice, our uh, candidate today. And um, we want to get going. So with no undue, oh, one other thing is, is that at the end of the, presentations we will be putting in a feedback form and we encourage you all to please complete the feedback form as we go along and then as we go along you can pose your questions in the chat and then we have a question and answer session at the end of uh, Ellen's talk and we please encourage you to to participate as this is a conversation so without further ado um, and I'd like to welcome Ellen Tice, and it is, can we say, a coincidence that it worked out this way that we celebrated Liasa's 25th anniversary and Ellen is the first president of Liasa, so I think our timing was very good and, and it wasn't done on purpose, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good timing. So as, as you know, Ellen is a senior director of library and information services at the Stellenbosch University and she's been there since 2006. Um, she has previously held positions as university librarian at the University of Western Cape and also deputy university librarian at the University of the Witwatersrand. So um, Ellen holds a B-Bubble Honours degree from the University of the Western Cape and a Master of Philosophy in Science and Technology from Stellenbosch University. So she has uh, served in a number of leadership roles. First of all, as we indicated, she was the first president of LIASA and she was also uh, president of IFLA. Uh, I don't want to give everything away Ellen can tell us her story and we look forward to listening and hearing what she has to say and, and her experiences as a leader in Liasa. So uh, without further ado, Ellen, can I hand over to you? Thank you very much, um, Ingrid. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, and I'd also like uh, to, to thank the ICBIS uh, committee uh, for um, inviting me um, to, uh, to address you this morning. And, um, you know, I also want to congratulate you on the series. Um, I think it is um, very prudent um, that, uh, that you have this. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's because it is, it is, it is needed. <laughs> so much um, as not just in terms of the library profession, but as we also have experienced, especially over the last two years, also um, in the world, um, you know, in our own country, in the continent, there's just so many things that's, that's happening. And a lot of people uh, or many of us, uh, you know, experience um, some of the turmoil <laughs> that we have in the world and that we experience basically on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it is because of the economy, uh, politics, um, uh, the pandemic uh, that we have experienced, uh, the climate uh, changes that are taking place, disaster, let me put it like that. All of these things are compounded in us, you know, probably feeling um, very um, anxious, um, um, and um, and and I and I think a lot of people link that to 
of, in some cases, maybe as a lack of leadership. Um, and, and, and I think, um, you know, when South Africa moved, uh, uh, transitioned to a democracy in 1994, there was a lot of, we have to have conversations about, you know, what has happened. Of course, there was the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Um, but, I, but I don't think, you know, and, and a lot of those things happened in terms of people that made things happen, that we need conversations, we need conversations with leaders um, um, and with understanding and being able to hear what kind of leadership um, we need and that we have in terms of how we um, want to ensure that we have a more <laughs> stable future, if I can put it uh, like, like that. And I'm, I'm using that uh, not in terms of perhaps describing myself as, as one of those people, but rather to, to, to contextualize the, the fact, this series and, as I said, in general, um, having conversations around this. And, of course, uh, there is no one leader that consists, in any case, uh, all the wisdom and can do everything. Um, that we need to understand uh, where we are and what it is that we need to change in order to have the kind of future um, that we, uh, those of us who've been around for a long time, um, we've been through different phases, but I'm, I'm thinking specifically about uh, those with children and grandchildren um, that you want to have that uh, idea of, you know, being positive, you know, that there is a future for us, and to some extent, we don't have it. And of course, that is also important uh, for the profession. So now, I remember when Fatima asked me, and um, she said, you're going to have this, and uh, she, she did indicate when we were packing yesterday that, you know, some questions, and I uh, couldn't actually remember <laughs> exactly, I just know I had to do this uh, and that they asked me to participate in it. Uh, but as I usually do, for sessions like this, I, I, I tend to, to follow, you know, what I would like, uh, what I think is needed and what I would like to do, um, you know, and, and using uh, an opportunity like this. So, so, so it may not necessarily be structured in the same way that others have done it, um, but I, 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 I thought, I would like to start off first by, you know, and again, we've heard from Ingrid uh, some, some of my, my background. Um, I just want to go a little bit big, but I, I want to sort of end up more about talking about the kind of leadership um, that I think that, um, and it's in different phases, and in a sense, they all come together. Um, to, to talk about uh, to talk about that and some of the characteristics. Uh, I just hope Nora is not uh, here because if Nora is here, I'm uh, going to hear from her that, you know, can I write something for me also in touch on what I'm going to say <laughs> today? <laughs> I know the recording will be available. Um, uh, and then I would have to say, Nora, I actually, you know, I just made some very rough notes. Um, but, but, but I actually realized when I was thinking about what, what are the kinds of things that I want to say that probably for me, that would be the most important message that I want to give today. And that I hope um, that you can take from that and see, you know, maybe where you fit in uh, and, and how can you also try to use some of this to see, um, you know, how that can influence, uh, you know, uh, your own uh, your own journey and so on. So the other thing that I wanted to do, but I'll start a little bit first about, of course, you know, a little bit about my career and 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 of course my role in Liasa, um, because um, and in IFLA, because all of that uh, is basically what uh, played a role in, um, you know, when I think of. Um, my uh, leadership style and, and, and how that was influenced by uh, basically my, my career. Um, now, I wanted to, to share 
uh, I've actually selected some filters, but unfortunately the scanner um, we used um, uh, was too high level, so I couldn't actually copy, um, you know, the the filters in. But I, I just want to share, I will probably share a couple of photos, but the one that I want to start off is actually this one. And I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, I can just see, share screen. And I see you can, you can see my screen, eh? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay, but I, the, uh, let me just share this, but I actually want to do, go with, share the next one. Um, <laughs> you'll see Fatima oh there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this is the annual conference 2004. Um, I, I'm not on the photo. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm not on the photo. Um, because I definitely was at the conference, I think. I'm not sure who was chair in the Western Cape. Uh, I can remember, I can I recognize some of the people here, <laughs> but it was just interesting as I was going through my album that I saw this one. And I thought, well, I have to, to share this. But Timo, you have not changed at all. <laughs> you look still like you looked in 2004. Um, and of course, there's Genevieve Pard and, uh, and so on, Tommy, Naomi, Nora. Um, and some some of the uh, so the Western Cape Liasa, I'm not sure if it's still being done at every conference, and I think it started actually from the first conference that uh, they took a photo of all the Western Cape um, delegates uh, to to the conference. So um, so yes, um, well as 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 I said, as we've heard, but maybe I'll I'd like to go back a little bit uh, earlier in terms of how I first of all got to be, <laughs> became how I came to be a librarian. And it, it is really cliche um, that I really literally did love reading books from a very young age. From as, as soon as I was able to read, I went a year earlier to school. Um, and uh, in the uh, rural town where I grew up, um, the library, the, uh, the small public library was just, we didn't have a library in the school, but the uh, uh, public library was literally just across um, our house, our home. And um, so I was, I didn't really play a lot uh, with other kids <laughs> uh, as much as I was actually reading. So from a very young age, I, used, I was going to the library and then once a month, I think the bus came from Cape Town <laughs> with the new books um, to, um, to all the, the towns. And I think that's probably still, still happening to some extent. Um, and um, so usually I had to wait till by the time that the mix, the new books come, then I've already read all the other books um, um, in, in the library. And I also very early on had to start reading also the uh, 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 older ages um, in, in the library. Uh, so, so I literally love reading. I read everything, you know, from magazines and um, even in the town, my parents, my mother was a teacher, a primary school teacher, and um, um, she used to order and get uh, her um, magazine. She had the the, the from it, um, and that came by a post. Um, so it was actually delivered. So we had always have had access to to read books and so on. And I think for, for that time, if you think about growing up, um, uh, which which was something that uh, we actually now realize, you know. What, what a great privilege it, it was. So anyway, um, I also, I finished my high school. We moved to Gauteng from the Northern Cape and I finished my high school in Panadendal at Imo Beer High School. And of course that was also, it's a very historic town as we know, uh, the history of it in terms of education and of course the Moravian church and all of that. 
So, um, so I finished my matric. I was uh, was uh, sixteen for the whole of matric, and I was seventeen in October. And then I um, started then the next year at um, at uh, my first year, nineteen seventy nine, <laughs> at at um, uh, the University of the Western Cape. Now, I actually wanted to go back to 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 redo my matric because I, I've been fairly one of the, the top students. However, um, uh, I wasn't very happy with my results. So when I had to go to university, so I was always going to do either accountancy uh, or I was also interested in doing law. Um, but so I ended at the university and um, in that first week, um, so I didn't then, because my results were not that well, good, <laughs> I decided that um, I had a few options in terms of what a few options in what I wanted to do. So um, when we had to then select our our um, subjects and you know what we're going to register for, I heard somehow, and I didn't even know at that time that you can actually um, uh, that you study for librarianship. Of course, I I was not aware of that. And, and then I, I heard um, uh, people talking about, um, you know, but, you know, about you can study for librarianship. And I like, oh my goodness, you know, I love books. I, 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 this is probably, you know, I'm going to go and, and find out and about this and so on. And I thought, my word, I couldn't believe it that you can actually study librarianship. So then I, um, enrolled and at that time so I enrolled for the lower diploma in library information science um, and um, and my my first uh, job was actually at the University of the Free State at the time and uh, that was um, you know so that is after I finished my uh, lower diploma uh, from there I after that mm -hmm. I worked at the satellite library of the university the medical library at Palanomi Hospital. Um, uh, so I wasn't on the main campus. In fact, there was I was probably the first um, person that actually have had a, a post matric qualification that actually uh, a person of color that actually was on the staff because it was quite uh, something, um, you know, uh, at uh, the University of Free State then. And um, uh, and so yeah, so I was just the first month as part of the training. I was actually at the medical library at the hospital at the University of the Free State. Um, I can't remember this anybody here from the Free State. I can't remember now um, the the name of the hospital, the training hospital for the University of the Free State. So so if and then I went to work for a year in a public library in Kaoteng. Um, and then I uh, was then um, uh, Professor Isabel Solier, who was then the um, head of the department at uh, UWC. She contacted me and she said to me, well, there's going to be a post for a library assistant at the University of the Western Cape. And she always, uh, she wanted me to continue um, to study, to continue my studies and to do the degree. And um, she said she's going to, um, I have to come back so that I can then, you know, I would, if I work at the university, I can study part-time. So, um, so, so, so I always tell the story also in terms of what has been shaping my career in the way that I had approached also my career. And that was, um, my first job was basically because I was completely alone. Um, in this um, satellite library, and um, it's the best job that you can do. I had, of course, I had reported to the head of the uh, medical library um, at on the main campus. However, basically, I was in charge of this. My first job, and I'm in charge of, of the library. Um, and we had to set up, they brought, we got a room, the journals, of course, medical journals, as we know, is the mainstay of medical uh, librarianship and what the doctors need if they're on their rounds in the hospitals. So I could literally, any day of tomorrow, if I feel that I want to change and move this now there and so on, 
um, you had to set yourself what you have to do. And even though I was there completely alone and on my own, I was busy every day. I learned the best that I could because I was able to actually do that. And, and I think that is what had always taken me through my career, that in all the places where I started, um, that I have never uh, just seen it as, you know, this is my job and now this is what I have to do. I've always, I would come in and I would say, assess the situation. And I would say to myself, okay, so what, what do we have to do here? What is the approach, you know? I, I just can't just, somebody tell me this is what I must do. So it's already one characteristic. And I think I learned that from my first job. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, 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 so it went. Um, uh, from there at UWC, I was there for, worked there for 11 years, uh, but in various positions. Um, to senior library assistant. Um, later, I became, as we started to network and um, started with, um, um, uh, sorry, and I was also, yeah, I think at some point I was also head of circulation, I can't remember. But my last job at UWC was, um, was then as systems librarian. So there was, uh, um, uh, I Think, no, it's not even my class. So I literally learned how to, to, to uh, work with um, IT networks, uh, putting in new systems. And I can't even tell you what systems we use at that time. But in any case, it is something that I have never done, of course, myself. It was all, it was, I learned that on the job. I attended a few courses. And that's another uh, uh, characteristic or tip that I want to give in terms of leadership. Um, and I, I think it, it will come to what is my first type of uh, leadership that I've been exposed to. Um, and it, it is something that has really gone through from that time already that I have, again, if you, somebody, if you, if there's an opportunity and you ask to do something, don't think, oh, but I don't know how to do this. Um, or I've never done this or, um, or anything like that. But yes, you haven't done it, but you know, but maybe you can learn how to do it. And actually, you know, maybe you can even become the best in terms of what you were doing. So, so I've been always been up to explore, to be up for a challenge. And I think what helps that is also reading, is the fact that I have this curiosity that I've I've always have had a much broader thinking or view of just what I am used to. Um, and and that is that is that is the the marvel of of being able to uh, uh, to to read to to think about things. So so there's nothing that you can't do if number one if we you know you can go and read you can go to other people to help you. Um, there's always other people that have more experience or know more than than you know you you will never be able to know everything that you need to know. But as long as that is there, then that you know you can actually, you, you can accomplish really um, um, everything. So, um, so, so from there, um, I uh, decided, okay, I can't remember exactly what the motivation was, but I did my um, um, uh, field work at BITS as well, because my, my family was in, in Joburg. And then this position came up at BITS for um, assistant um, university librarian, excuse me. I applied. Um, and then the, the two people, this is part of what I would call um, accidental leadership. That's the first leadership that I want to talk about. Um, because um, when when I applied for 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 that post, I, I didn't necessarily think I didn't think I would get the post, but my boss at the at the time at UWC, Colin Dodge, um, he 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 said to me, um, um, no, you know, do it, and, you know, if you get this because this would be at Wits University, then um, it it would be great, and he supported it, and then my boss at um, at Bits was uh, Heather Edwards, um, who has retired now, 
And she was another person that influenced a lot of the way that I, and things that I ended up doing because um, when I, and of course, uh, uh, before she retired, and then I then was uh, promoted to deputy university librarian. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's how I got exposed to, to, to Liasa. And as I've said in the um, Liasa in Touch article, um, up till that time, I was not involved in any library associations. In fact, I probably attended one or two um, uh, workshops as part of the IT training, network training. And I've never been uh, a member of any associations. As you know, at the time, we had three different Alivo, Alasa, uh, Sailors, um, and, and so on and so on. So I, I've never, I didn't actually think it's something, but I really felt um, in order to get to know people. So when the this DESA, uh, first conference came up, you know, this would be a way for me to actually go and just um, meet librarians from other from other libraries and uh, to, 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 to get to know, uh, and not just, you know, being, being at bits. So, so that's how I became in, uh, involved in LIASA when they had to uh, elect for the interim committee, um, uh, uh, committee members. My colleagues from Bits University basically said to me, you know, put up your hand. And there was one or two other, I don't know if I actually, uh, said much in the meeting itself, um, but um, uh, they said, you know, do it. So I became the secretary. And this is another thing that I would say, people normally sometimes don't want to be the secretary, but I've always said, I think, again, it was the best thing that could have happened to me in starting, getting involved in library associations to be the secretary, because as a secretary, you have to know everything. You have to write the minutes, you need to understand, you need to liaise, you are probably the most more important than the chair or the president, because you are the one, if the minutes are not correct, if it's not on time, um, you know, this all, it can have a big impact on the association. But again, I have had, um, uh, got the support from, 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 from my boss at the time, Heather, uh, and when I was looking at the article and photos, I actually saw that Heather was actually in Bloemfontein, the first um, Liasa conference, she was actually the, um, the chair, um, uh, uh, one of the guest speakers um, at, at the library, uh, at the first Liasa conference. Um, and again, when there was the call, you know, or people approached me and said, you know, do you want to be, uh, you know, shall we nominate you to be the, the president? Um, Again, I was like, you know, no, I, I'm not so sure, you know, I only just became an I've worked. It was very hard to work for the two years if this is actually really something. But, and this is another uh, tip, um, uh, as I said already, you can't do everything on your own. It's there's always other people, there's mentorship. There are people that uh, probably recognize that there are something in, in you uh, that you may not recognize yourself. So, so I was, I, I didn't say, so, so, so this is what I found in terms of some definitions for accidental leaders. Um, they are those people that don't necessarily set out to become leaders, but through good luck or being in the right place at the right time, fall into the role. And I have to say, and I'll, that I was certainly at the beginning stages, one of those people that I was just at the right place, in the right place at the right time. Another definition, accidental leaders are people who find themselves in leadership role that they hadn't planned for, or that they may have planned for, but weren't expecting it to happen at the time. And then there's another one that says, accidental leaders are experts in their field with a high level of education and experience who were promoted into a leadership role based on their hard work and expertise, or in some cases are those that who did not set out to become leaders, but fell into that role through good luck, and again, of all being in the right place at the right time. Now, um, to a large extent, of course, it has it goes with very hard work. You don't just if people recognize you as somebody that can possibly be um, somebody that 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 could be good in you know um, a leading in association, like in this case, or even later on, you know, in terms of my 
management role that I have played, um, that is only recognized if you put in the work, um, if you are prepared to commit and do a lot of, and work very hard. And we have worked really hard until three o'clock in the morning. I'm sure some of you have heard this. Uh, we have had meetings until three o'clock in the morning. Um, um, uh, and sometimes two hours sleep before the next day that the conference starts. So, so that's 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 uh, what it actually is. And I was very much uh, this accidental in the same way, in terms of my role in Liasa, uh, sorry, as IFLA. In a sense, it was also accidental. I was at the right place. I was the first president. We were readmitted to IFLA, but again, um, you know, attending my first conference, getting a grant to go to Denmark. Um, uh, again, I was not on the program. We all had to do a country report and I was asked to come. Oh my goodness, I'm so, speaking too much. Um, I was asked to, to, um, uh, to chair one of the sessions and I'm like, it's my first pre ifla conference. My goodness, um, you know, international conference for that matter. I, I, you know, can I do that? So I spoke to Kay Ratsaroka I'm sure many of you do know her. I said to Kay, and she was at this big conference, Robert Roka, there were a number of people from other developing countries. And I said to Kay, Kay, um, I've been asked uh, by so-and-so from the governing board and who was there in charge of the conference to chair the session. Um, I'm not sure if I can actually do this. And Kay, I've learned, this is something else, I've learned this from Kay, and she said to me, um, Ellen, if you get an opportunity like this, if there are people that see that you're able to do, you don't ask, you don't even question that. You take it um, and you do the best that you can uh, with that. And in a sense, I would say, you know, then going on to the main conference in Copenhagen, the other conference was in Albert in the north of, of, of um, that by the time we got to to the other conference. So now senior leadership, and through the also of course, as well, because we had the presidents and secretary generals and all these other leaders were involved in Liasa and admitting uh, South Africa back into IFLA. So, so, so yes, so if, there are, if an opportunity comes along, you have to take that. Um, it, it, um, it really shows, um, it, it builds your character and it gives you a sense of what you're able to do. You wouldn't know what you're able to do. <laughs> it's not if you're appointed in the position. Um, and, and I really think it was through, uh, you know, all of those things that it led that people would recognize or that if people then have to think or ask that they would say, oh, this person did a good job or we should ask this person and so on. And again, that is also the rest is history. I was actually at the thing at my second oh, that at that conference elected to the at those years we actually did the election at the conference at IPLA, uh, elected to the standing committee for Africa. Uh, there I was also secretary, and then I think at my next meeting, um, uh, two or three meetings after that. Or after my Liasa presidency, I was then also elected to the IFLA governing board. And in my first term already, I was then elected also to the executive committee. Kay became president. I served my first two years, uh, four years on the board, two terms. Um, I served as um, uh, on the IFLA governing board uh, and I stood against a very, very um, uh, experience uh, uh, people from other countries, um, you know, from the north, um, northern hemisphere, and, and I was um, e elected there and also on to the executive committee. So, and then of course, there was the four years in between, that's when we also won the bid to host Liasa in Durban. And then after I finished that, um, I then also um, was then um, uh, from 2007, um, uh, nominated, and this was through people again from from Europe and other countries. They had asked if they can nominate me, um, and um, and that also how I was then uh, again. I competed against a very um, influential uh, 
candidates from major countries um, in the world and IFLA members, um, and, and I won the election. Um, but again, um, all of that was through very, very um, hard work. And I know I should be finishing off soon. I have actually more uh, to say that I wanted to. But let me just talk about the other three leadership styles. And I think all of these in the end, and to end off with a kind of leadership that I see uh, that I would want to, to, with which I would like to see also that I have, can leave some kind of legacy. Uh, um, and this, the, the second one, which I have really worked, uh, learned um, and developed through Liasa and later on also uh, linked to my management style and as um, in the positions as, um, uh, as a director at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, when I was at WITS, I was then um, headhunted uh, for the position at, um, at UWC. And then uh, while I was at UWC, I was then also headhunted uh, basically for this position here at Stellenbosch University. Um, and, um, and I've made those choices for various reasons. Uh, when I came to Stellenbosch, it was just before I was uh, 2000, uh, 2006, of course, and two, at that time, I was already being uh, processed uh, the election for, for IFLA. But the second type of leadership is participative leadership, and that I've really learned in Liasa. And participative leadership is a leadership style whereby leaders listen to their employees and involve them in the decision-making process. It, re it requires an inclusive mindset, good communication skills, and the ability and inclination to share power. Now, having been in how Liasa started, it would not have been possible for us that you had to, to it was all about. Um, it's not, there isn't this one leader. It's all of us are collective leaders. Now, Nelson Mandela had used that a lot of times when he came out of prison. Um, and when he became, and what, what he had said, he always talked about, you know, the, it's the ANC, it's the collective um, and not the individual. And you learn that through organizations like Lias, it's the best place to learn this. And these are some of the characteristics, curiosity. Participative leaders are curious, always looking for fresh and innovative ideas from their employees to improve the business, excellent communication skills, ability to empower workers, broad-mindedness and good listening skills. And then this, this third one, which of course has mostly been in, uh, uh, applied in, as, a, as a management of, um, you know, uh, as, uh, in the library, but also management in terms of, you know, being a president of an association, being president of IFLA, um, you know, uh, 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 chairing, um, and setting and looking also um, developing strategic goals that you also have to do this. Um, and, I, and I have to say, you know, my, you know, some people, you know, I mean, uh, chairing the General Assembly, it's, it's huge with uh, nearly 3,000, 3,800 delegates, um, knowledgeable, experienced people all over the world. But, you know, you go up there and you just know that you are now the one that has to ensure and that needs to drive the association um, and people expect that from you. So, so strategic leadership is a practice in which executives using different styles of management develop a vision for their organization that enables it to adapt to or remain competitive in a changing economic and technological climate. In particular, it looks at the role of strategic leaders in five main areas. One, developing strategic and organizational processes. Two, leading and developing people. Three, developing culture and value systems. Four, developing distinct organizational competencies. And five, developing effective networking. Now, that, that is something that I think, so as I said, in the end of the day, except perhaps for accidental uh, leaders. Um, the participative one, it's all part of that. The strategic one, it's all part of that. But the last leadership um, 
uh, style that I want to mention. Uh, I had lunch with two friends of mine a few weeks ago and um, on a Sunday, and we were just talking about also the state of the country. And then he mentioned to me and he said, you know, he's been thinking more, he's also written books uh, in terms of leadership and management in schools, particularly, that's his area of expertise. And, um, and then he, meant, he talked about intentional leaders. And then he, leadership, and then he explains uh, what this is. And I said to myself, oh, you know, I think I've probably, that is how had been my approach, but I didn't actually realize that there is a, a term for that. And so preparing for this, and I thought this is what I would like to leave you with, is because um, this is what I think, what, would, what makes one effective as leaders. Um, keeping in mind the other things. Um, and, you know, just looking up also from our friend Google, uh, so this is not proper research, <laughs> uh, is uh, the question, how do you become an intentional leader? And then it says, without intentional leadership, teams can lose confidence in their company's goals and become less effective, feeling like there is no well-thought-out plan. This disengagement often leads to the loss of key talent. You know, sometimes people say, you know, no, I'm just going to leave because I don't know where is this organization going and so on. And then the other thing that it says is when you are intentional, you choose to make decisions and take action on what's important to you. And I always say this kind of leadership does not mean that you only, it's that's only the head or only the manager or only the rector. Or I say every person, and especially in the library profession, is and has the potential and also apply some of these things. Because the staff member, even if, if you work at the circulation desk, or if you work in any other division, if you're a metadata librarian, um, if you're an acquisitions librarian, um, in terms of you, because you make the decision when you come in, you know, but today I am going to make sure and I'm going to catalog um, my 10 books and I'm going to make sure that it is so so it is you that take that decision so it's not the decisions are not only at every level of the organization we make decisions in terms of that will in 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 any case eventually impact on everything else but everyone is a leader like you are in your home like you are in your relationships but at work it doesn't matter what type of work you're doing all of us, all of us have to do that. And unless you, if, if you don't see that, then you're only going to rely on other people. They take the decision, so I'm just doing what I have to do. No, that's not true. Because if you decide that you're not going to do your best or that you're going to you know, do as little as possible and you just get your salary, um, then it's you that made that decision. Um, because you want, you, you say, this is how I'm going to do my job. You make a decision about, we can give you the job, we, you have the job description and all of that, but how you do that and how you apply it, it's you that take, you also take a decision on how you do that. Um, so being intentional means getting clear upfront about what you want to achieve. You intentionally set an intention to achieve a specific outcome. Again, Everybody, I feel, especially now, you know, because it is the intention. Today, I'm going to be doing this. Today, I'm going to make sure that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if the user comes in and the user is not, or somebody has not done his or her job, but you're going to make sure that this will be the outcome. Or you might feel, I'm going to speak out about this. I'm not happy with this. Or somebody didn't do his or her work. But now we all are treated as if we didn't do our work. It's intentional. You should all should be intentional. And these are just some of the last, the eight ways to be an intentional leader. leader. And this links to what I just said. Personal commitment to self-development. Leader development, of course, daily, not in a day. It is you have to take responsibility also. You commit that I'm going to improve myself. You commit that I'm going to read more about this. You commit, you have to do that. It is your personal commitment. That makes you also an, a leader. Ask 
listen and learn. I believe that's very important. I said right at the beginning, you don't know everything yourself. Earn trust. It's very difficult. I know I have experience in places. I know what can happen. It's not that this is a very, very difficult one. I try my best to make sure that I want to earn trust of people in order for them, because then we can move forward. Develop others. I feel very passionate about this. I don't come to work if it's in this, if it, whether it's my PA, whether it's the admin system, whether it is, um, you know, we have developed staff who, when I came at Stellenbosch, who were um, not even full-time staff. Um, one person worked at the access control. He got his degree, library science degree from UWC. He is now working in the university archives um, and he's in a professional post. Um, you know, intentionally, you look at others, you develop them, you also create a clear purpose-driven team. Again, I'm trying to do this, <laughs> to try to make sure it's not always, again, possible. Sometimes there are people that do not share your agenda, but if you get to a point where you can have a purpose-driven team that knows exactly what it is that we want to achieve, we do that by I would start a meeting, perhaps sometimes there I would say, you know, I'll do a little bit of a preaching thing or something has happened and I use that. Uh, if I have a staff meeting, I speak about what is happening and how that impacts what we're doing. So um, uh, you, you have to do that um, so that we know that we're not just here again just to do our job, but we have a purpose that we want to make sure that we achieve here. Communicate perspectives with optimism and energy. As you can see, as I'm talking and continue to talk, I get more energy. I get energy from these kinds of things because it means that I'm not saying we're hopeless. As they say, hope is so important. It is that we can create a, a future in terms of if we put, the, and we can't just think about all, all the things that are so bad. Both teams is the seventh one. And the last one, lead change. And that's critical for me. You can't be an intentional leader if you don't lead change. If you're in a leadership position, you have to lead the change. And I think I've taken much more time than you have given me. Um, so uh, back to, to, to Ingrid. And thank you very much. There's a lot more that I could actually talk about. I said I'm not going to have this much. This is just some, a few of the photographs uh, from IFLA 2009. This was at the function, uh, you know, where I was going to be inaugurated as the new IFLA president. And then just a few of the pictures that I was able to um, put in the PowerPoint. Um, you know, there's so many. I've visited over uh, more than 72 countries. Um, um, I've been, you know, it's just an extraordinary and such a privilege. Um, but Liasa, my institutions where I work, this was at the National Library of Singapore. Um, and then just to say also, um, I, I couldn't find my other books, but um, besides reading, I was always interested also. So, you know, in order to be effective as a leader, again, you have to read. So I've also read a lot of leadership uh, books. Um, and um, unfortunately, I now no longer have time. Stop sharing my screen. I, I no longer have time, but I hope um, that when I retire, I've got a lot of bibliographies. I like to read, learn, you know, how other leaders have also approached certain things. And that also helps build your idea. And now I know I really have to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. I think that you've had uh, such a very uh, interesting career that you, we, we can't certainly do justice to it. And I uh, thank you for sharing so candidly with us uh, right from the beginning. I like that you started uh, before <laughs> even uh, going to university and um, starting very early with where your relationship with the librarianship started. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, give colleagues an opportunity to ask any questions. So we'll just, I'll just check to see if there are hands. You don't mind, I'm just going to have my tea as Ab well. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. It is a conversation. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, we bring our coffee and our tea and biscuits. 
Okay, I don't see uh, any hands. I'll just check the chat to see if there are any questions in the in the chat. So while people are thinking about it, I wanted to ask you, uh, I've got a question for you, and I wanted to ask you, Ellen, um, uh, if there's, I think you were already probably at uh, Stellenbosch University during the Fees Must Fall campaign. Uh, you certainly, you would have been there uh, during COVID lockdowns. These are periods of crisis. Uh, and I think it's really challenging to lead during these times. Do you have any personal insights about leadership, about yourself in leadership during time, you know, these kinds of uh, crisis times? Um, yes, yes, certainly. I've, I've, I had a, a, a photo of the first photo was of, of three books, and one of that one was around um, uh, transformation. I just want to. Um, to actually just um, uh, evoking a transformation um, and which is one that links to the major change at Stellenbosch University. Uh, as, uh, sort of the whole visual read this was as a result of the peace must fall uh, and roads must fall. And there was a lot of um, a negative um, comments about also, you know, the, the library, and the library was very much seen of colonial and of course Stellenbosch University in, it, in itself. So, for example, we have uh, uh, African uh, maps, uh, we have a very good collection of African maps. So I was on sabbatical that year, and I know um, there was a concern because of what happened at UCT, as you know, some of the artwork um, that was removed and uh, mm. Burn. The Sarah Bartman uh, sculpture in particular caused a lot yes, of uh, controversy. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So there was yeah. a concern around that, you know, that that might happen here. So the, it was actually removed. So as I said, I wasn't here. Uh, they did uh, make me aware of it, but I said, okay, um, I understand in terms of the mood of the mm. people. Uh, but but I also, and of course, there were some, you know people were referring to some of the books and because on one of the maps, there was also terminology. So, but, but what, again, for me, it's, it's part of, you know, being intentional. So one of the things they were looking at name changes and the uh, J.S. Hierica Library, which has been renamed Stellenbosch University Library, was one of the, the things that, that we have changed. There's also a number of other things that I had since, and in this book, we have a chapter uh, from the library where we explain about this, these changes and, 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 and how we manage it, how we had to manage it, and of course, what the reaction was, uh, the processes that were followed. So the whole book, the different visual readers at the university uh, actually speaks about that. Um, during, during so, 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 and I think, you know, in terms of leading change, you actually have to, the, the only way that you can actually think about and how, how to do this is that you have to continuously, you have to be agile, you have to continuously adapt. And that's what also the last two years made us actually think. It's, it's like, I mean, there were days that I said, you know, but there's just no, we literally had to meet um, every week, sometimes, you know, via WhatsApp, you know, or I would call an urgent meeting when they were working from home. Um, and the other thing that I think came to the fore a lot during COVID-19 uh, that we as uh, sometimes don't necessarily have done that so proactively in the past is that we did really not think about how does this impact on, on people, on the staff. And, um, and I remember the first meeting we had when we were physic could physically meet in the auditorium in 2020. Um, what I did that day is, and not all the staff were there because I actually mentioned every staff member by name. And that made a huge difference. And also it's about that people say, we're all the same, we're together in this. And uh, the, I think we became more aware as, as managers, as leaders, as head, that we actually have to, that we need, that we got to know our staff much better that we realized that, and even they realized, you know, that 
um, yes, you know, we have to make certain decisions and manage certain things, but ultimately, we're going to only get through this together. And it's also, you know, forward together is the slogan of the university in terms of our new vision. It's the only way that we can do that. People need to feel that they recognize and that they, the staff, that together we have to do that. And those are some of the things that, that I became aware of. I did make some promises that when we return to normal, that we, would, we do, are continuing with some of the things. Mm. But one of the things that I, and I didn't have time is to say, you know, maybe once a month, you know, just get one division or two divisions together. We just sit, have tea together and we just, you know, hear from people. So, so, so I think we sort of back to, you know, each one in their corner, but we can do a lot more than, uh, but those, those are the things. But, but, but I think we, the staff wellness was probably had become much more important than it was before. Mm. Well, thank you, Ellen. We are rapidly running out of time. Um, I, ha I have more questions and I, and I love this thing, this last thing on intentional leadership uh, because it, um, there's an Arabic word, uh, uh, which means, which is intention, which is used often, you know, I grew up with it in the uh, Muslim community in Cape Town uh, and speaks a lot about intention. I also just wanted to say this um, somewhere in the, um, uh, the definitions for accidental leadership, which, 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 which you say that <laughs> is how you entered into the uh, 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 working in library associations. But you know, Oprah says that there's no such thing as good luck. Oprah mm -hmm. says it's the result of hard work. And that is also something that you've mentioned a, a bit. And it's also something that we've picked up in other conversations is, is hard work. And I think that working until 3 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if nothing else, it's certainly a testimony to the hard work. And I think um, the hard work can only come as a result of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that I just wanted to, and we are now really out of time, but I just wanted to pick up uh, on this is um, you spoke a little bit about the hesitancy uh, when you were given an opportunity. And I just wanted to reflect and, and say that it does take courage to plow through your own sort of um, I'm not so confident about this. So, I, I, and this is also something I think that we need to mention that it does take courage uh, to take up these leadership positions. I am now, we are now completely out of time. So I'm not even gonna ask you the very last question that I wanted to ask. We'll have to keep it for another time. Um, let me then hand over to Sarah uh, to do the closing. Is there, oh, I see there's a, Ah, uh, uh, Sarah can speak to it. There's something in the chat. It's the forms. I will, I will stop talking now, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Fatima, and uh, thank you very much, Ellen, for joining us this morning and sharing your pivotal career moments. Um, I must say it is particularly fitting as we celebrate Lias's 25th birthday that we had the opportunity today to hear from the organization's first leader. It's been inspiring and motivating to learn about the path of leadership you have taken over the years, to hear about your involvement with LIASA and your thoughts and experiences on leadership, intent, self-development and self-actualization. Thank you. Um, as, <laughs> as we are um, at 11 o'clock now, uh, first I would like to say that I have put in a link for a feedback form. We would love to hear from the attendees and also those who watched past IGBIS with Leaders events. We want to know your thoughts and your experiences and how, how these conversations have perhaps inspired you to, to make changes or, or to take those small steps to leadership in any way, whether that's in your profession, in your community, or just in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so we would appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, next, I'm going to ask Kahiso if uh, he can grab some screenshots of uh, everyone joining us today. It is something we like to do at the end of each session. Um, so if everyone would like to turn their cameras on, you don't have to, but we would like to see you. <laughs> and um, 
and we can just grab a couple of screenshots of everyone. Hey, everyone. I also see some thank yous in the chats. Thank you to everyone. Uh, it has been an inspirational conversation today. Is that everybody? Okay. I wonder, Kahiso, uh, are you going to take the uh, screenshots or shall I? Okay, I'm going to take a couple of shots. So, uh, let's see. Okay, I hope everyone's smiling. Okay, I can't hear Kahiso, but I did manage to get a few. Hello, there's Kahiso. Hi. <laughs> I did get a couple of screenshots there as well. Okay, perfect. That's what it is. So that's brilliant. Um, thank you, everyone, for spending some time with us this morning. Um, I hope we hear some thoughts and comments from everyone. And uh, we also hope to see you at the next Equus with Leaders, which will, uh, news of which will come out shortly on the Viasa mailing list. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Go well. Goodbye.